So this week, this week, um, on Sunday, Sunday was the seventh of Cheshvan, and we all know that the seventh of Cheshvan is the day in Israel when we begin asking for rain. Not so in the diaspora, which has less need of rain. We ask for rain 60 days after the end of autumn, which is December 4th or 5th. But in Israel, it is two weeks after the end of, of the Chag, of Shemini Atzeret. And you all know why the delay. Why not ask for rain immediately after Sukkot? We don't want rain on Sukkot because we're sitting in our Sukkot. But surely we should request rain as soon as the holiday is over. We don't because we wait for the last pilgrim to arrive home who lives in the furthest and northernmost point of Israel by the Euphrates River and it would take him two weeks to get home and so the whole country delays asking for rain till till the, uh, the 7th of Cheshvan, which is two weeks after the conclusion of Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret. So that was this Sunday. So we're kind of taking leave, as it were, finally coming home after our hopefully profound and very moving holiday experience, each one of us. So I'm going to share with you something of a, a discourse a Hasidic discourse, a mimer that the Rebbe said one year um, before the guests would arrive from all over the world, particularly the, the guests from Israel that had come by chartered plane, um, before they took leave, before they went back home, so the Rebbe conducted a special Fabrengen, and I'm going to share with you something of what he taught there. Okay? So it's all based on a teaching in the Talmud that goes as follows. Let me read it to you. The Talmud says, Rabbi Mari, the son of Rav Huna, who was the son of Rav Yirmiya, the son of Abba. So Rav Mari taught, Not to be confused with Murray, this is Mori, an Aramaic name. So he taught as follows a famous teaching, my friends. A person should not take leave of his fellow except amid a discussion of a matter of halacha. For by doing so, he will remember him. All right? Pretty straightforward. As the commentaries point out, parting with the Torah thought will cause the friends to remember each other longer. Again, a person shouldn't take leave of his fellow other than out of a discussion, a matter of halacha. Then the Gemara goes on to tell a story or provide an illustration, an example. Such is the case of Rav Kahana who escorted Rav Shimi from Pumna Haro till Bey Tzinisia in Babylonia. So he escorted him till this point and they took leave of each other. Now when they arrived there at their location, at which point they took leave of each other, Sir Rav Kahan, who is escorting Rav Simi, said to him, he asked a question, Master, is it true what people say? That these Babylonian palm trees have existed from the time of Adam, the first man, till now. Rav Shimi didn't actually answer the question. But he responded and said, You reminded me with your question 
of a statement of Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi said, who taught the following. What's the meaning of the following verse? This is a verse in the book of Jeremiah Yeremi Yohu, chapter 2, verse 6, where the prophet describes the sojourn of our ancestors in the desert after the Exodus. And there it says, they traveled in a land through which no person passed and where no man settled. Fairly straightforward. Got a question. The question is, if no man passed or no person passed through it, then obviously nobody settled there. Actually, it's not referring to the Exodus. It's referring to a land, not the Exodus. My mistake. Because the Exodus people did pass through. This is referring to an area where no man, an absolutely desolate place, where no person passed through and no man settled. So the question is, if no person passed through, then obviously nobody settled there. So why must why does he repeat the obvious? He's describing a place of total desolation. All you have to say is no person ever passed through it. Then obviously nobody settled it. Why is he stating the patently obvious? Rather, the teacher was follows. Here's the deeper meaning of the verse. The verse is not simply repeating itself. The prophet is revealing the following. He says... Why is it, the, ver the prophet is explaining, that certain countries, no person, it's not countries, I'm sorry, areas in the world, that no person passes through? Why? Because Adam, the words are in the Hebrew, because Adam, now he understands Adam to be referring to Adam, the first person, not just a person. Adam can mean a man, or Adam can mean Adam, the first man. He says here the verse actually means Adam, the first man. And the meaning is, here's the quote. The verse is telling us, is teaching us, that any land that Adam, the first man, decreed for settlement, was subsequently settled. And any land that Adam, the first man, did not decree for settlement, was not settled and never will be. You reminded me, you asked me a question about Adam, you reminded me of this teaching. So now we understand the meaning of the verse. The verse says that no person passed through. And the verse now explains why. Because this is an area where Adam, the creed, should not be settled. That's the meaning of the words, Ashalei Yoshev, Adam Shem. Adam, the first person, didn't decree it should be settled. Therefore, nobody passed through. That's the meaning of the verse. There's no redundancy. The verse is actually explaining why some places are settled and other places are not. All decreed by the first man, Adam. Okay, so he responds. Rav Shimi responds to Rav Kahanda's question. What accompanied him, your question reminds me of this teaching, and he shared the teaching. End of discussion. Conclusion, in summary, the Gemara taught, well, I won't mention the names again because we get confused, the Gemara taught a teaching that a person shouldn't take leave of his fellow other than through a matter of halacha, discussion of a matter of halacha. Then it goes on to tell the story here that I just shared with you of Rav Kahan and Rav Simi and their dialogue. A number of questions. First question is, the fact that the Gemara relates this story and the dialogue right after teaching that one should not take leave of one's fellow other than through a teaching of Halacha, means there must be some intrinsic connection between this very teaching and the statement one shouldn't take leave other than through a teaching of halacha. 
What's the connection between this particular teaching about Adam settling, not settling? Furthermore, there doesn't appear to be a halacha here. He hasn't taught him a point of Jewish law, surely. He just shared with him an insight into a verse in the book of Jeremiah, a very interesting one, where Adam decreed, is settled, where it's not, he didn't decree to be settled, wasn't settled, but we just taught, the Gemara brings this story to illustrate that one shouldn't take leave of one's fellow other than through a discussion of halacha. This wasn't a discussion of halacha. This was a discussion, a teaching about a, a, a verse. It doesn't seem to be a practical halachic instruction. Halacha means law. Where's the law here? Where's the practical uh, instruction? Which is what halacha means. It's a nice insight into a verse. That's question number two. Question number three. Why must it be through words of halacha? Any teaching of Torah would be, would be a good way to remember each other. Why does the Gemara stress that it should be a dvar halacha, a matter of halacha, Jewish law? And a final question. The phraseology of the Talmud, of the teachings of our sages, is very precise. So what did he say? The original teaching. I'll say it in the Hebrew and translate. Al yipoter adam b'chavero elo mitoch dvar halacha shemitoch kach zochreihu. Translation again, a person should not take leave of his fellow except amid the discussion of a matter of halacha, for by doing this, he will remember him. Why phrase it this way? In the double negative, a person should not take leave other than this way. Just say it simply. A person should take leave of his fellow through a discussion of halacha. Say it affirmatively and simply, rather than in this rather convoluted, double negative way. That is our final question. And now we're going to proceed with the most profound answer to all of the above. But let's review the questions. Are you following me on all of this, folks? Yeah? Yes? Need some feedback and nod of the head. Yeah? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Good, thank you. All right, so just to quickly review the, uh, the questions. The Gemara said a person shouldn't take leave of his fellow other than through a discussion of, of a, a matter concerning halacha through which he will remember him. Each one will remember the other. Then it tells a story of Rav Kahana and Rav Simi and a teaching is then shared as they take leave of each other about Adam decreeing what should be settled, which areas of the world should be settled or not. And that's how the discussion of the Gemara concludes. And we're left scratching our head with a number of questions. And the questions were, this teaching of Adam, what this, why was this of all teachings the one that the Gemara chooses to share with us, the reader, in illustrating this teaching that one should not take part, take leave other than through words of Allah. Question two, there's no halacha here altogether. There's no point of Jewish law. It's a beautiful teaching. So where's the halacha? The Gemara tells the story to illustrate the point. It doesn't illustrate the point. They took leave not through halacha. Through another teaching. A teaching of Torah in general. Which leads to the next question. Why must it be halacha? Why can't we remember each other through any words of Torah? And let me add, why Torah altogether? They give a photograph, a gift, which is what people do. When you, you know, when you come to say, when someone's leaving, you give them a gift by which you want them to, a memento, to remember their stay and remember you. Uh, arguably, giving them something physical and tangible would be even a, 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 a more effective reminder than a teaching that one could forget. So why must it be through Torah? Never mind the words of Allah, any Torah, what's wrong with any other means to remember, arguably more effective. Okay, so you'll say that physical things eventually disappear, Torah remains, that's true, but we forget. We can forget the teaching. 
And I might suggest that a physical object, if it's if it has some substance, will last longer than my memory. So why must it be through Torah altogether, and particularly Dvar Allah? Why not anything? And then we asked the whole the way the teaching is phrased, is framed using the double negative is very strange. Just come out and say it simply. A person should take leave through of his fellow with words of halacha. Just say it that way. Rather than one should not take leave other than with words of halacha. It's very strange that it's it's uh, it's expressed so emphatically by using the double negative. Just say it positive. Two negatives make it positive. So just say it positively. Take leave through halacha rather than use the double negative. So the answer to all of the above, a very, very deep answer, which we, I guess we'll begin our discussion today. We'll see how we go. Not only is it a very deep answer, but we're going to, in this answer, get the mission statement for the journey of life. Not just a mission statement for the journey, but how does the journey begin in the first place? And why is it the way it is? Let me explain. A person shouldn't take leave of his friend. That's the actual terminology. Al yipater adam Who's the friend? Every fellow Jew is our friend. Call Yisrael Chavedim. All Jews are friends. The word for friend in Hebrew is Chaver. Chaver actually means to join. Chibur. That's what friendship is. Two people joined or attached. We're all family. We're all attached, we're all connected. Of course, we're all connected to all human beings. We are connected to all human beings because we're all human beings. We all come from the same God and the same source. Our fellow Jew is family. There's community in this family. Which is why we're all held by the world responsible for each other. For that matter, for we're responsible for all the world's ills as well. You're Jewish, doesn't matter what culture, what country, what color of your skin, you're all the same. The world is right, yeah, yeah, it's one family. But there's more. Who is our friend? God is our friend. As the verse states, let me quote the verse for you. Book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 17. The verse says, Do not forsake your friend or your father's friend. In the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the verse is in, yeah. Altazom, we can find it here. Uh, excuse me for a moment. Let's get the quote right. Okay, I'm not seeing it here, but the verse says, Do not forsake your friend or your father's friend. And that's referring, our sages say, Ah, here's the verse. It's, it's Mishle, Proverbs 27. Your friend and your father's friend do not abandon. Simple meaning is don't, don't abandon, don't, don't uh, treat friendship casually. Don't ignore friendship. 
nurture it, develop it, appreciate it. That's a simple meaning, and it's very good advice. But the deeper meaning is to the friendship. Who is the friend here? God. So listen to what's being stated here. Do not, a person ought not, should not, take leave of his friend, Chavir, other than through the words of Halach. What this means is this. It should not be that we are separate from each other or separate from God. It's undesirable. But we're already answering now the unusual phraseology. It doesn't say, take leave of your fellow through words of Allah, because it phrased it that way. We would understand it to be something that is natural, expected, normal. Take leave. That happens. How should you do so? To be remembered through words of Allah. But that would acknowledge its validity, its virtuousness even. By saying, do not take leave other, it's saying, you shouldn't take leave in the first place. But if you have to, then to be remembered, then speak your final words should be words of Allah. So what that is saying, therefore, is that we ought not be separate from God or our fellow Jew or by extension feel any sense of distance or separation from our fellow human being. It ought not be that way. We have to overcome the sense of distance, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual. Do not take leave is the way it's phrased, conveying powerfully the message that we ought to be united with each other and with God. But the fact is that we're not. There is physical distance and there is spiritual distance and emotional distance. How does this all happen? So now, friends, I'm going to share with you one of the most basic teachings of the Kabbalah upon which thousands of discourses in Hasidic literature uh, it, uh, it's based upon and explained and elaborated upon. The teaching from the book of Eitzchayim, the Tree of Life, authored by Rabbi Chaim Vital, the primary disciple of the Arizal. So it's a very simple, basic teaching, deceptively simple in its language. As I just told you, the few words I'm going to share with you now are the subject of thousands of discourses and pages. This is what it says. And I'm sharing this with you to explain how is it and where does it all start that there is distance and separation from each other and from God. So this is how it all begins. The very outset explains the Eitz Chaim, the, this classic work of Kabbalah. The infinite light filled all of existence. Or en sof memalet kol that was the initial stage. And then, Silik et Oroha Gadol el Atzad. God removed his infinite light, as it were, to the side, creating a makom chalal, a vacuum. And in this vacuum, God projects a ray of his divine presence, a ray of light called the Kav, which means literally a line that projects into this vacuum, the Makom Chalal. And this line is a line of descending, limited revelation, diminishing light. And all of existence emerges at some point on this projection of diminishing contained and more finite revelation as the light descends. We, the universe, exists at the bottom of this whole process, of this line or this ladder, descending ladder of divinity. We're all familiar of the four worlds and the seven heavens. They all exist 
different points of light or revelation on this ladder, this orderly structured ladder of divinity. So now we speak about levels and closer to God and further from God, higher, lower, distance, nearness. This all emerges as a result of the creative process that I just described. And I'm going to mention another word that you're all familiar with from the Kabbalah, from Hasidus. The word is the Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum means contraction, concealment, veiling of the infinite light, that first critical step of creation. The infinite light is eclipsed, Tzimtzum. The result of that is this spiritual vacuum in which creation takes place. All of the levels of creation, all of the heavens and the spiritual worlds in this ladder of divinity, upper to lower. And we're at the bottom of the ladder. And that's where distance is born. Now to be sure, this whole ladder, closer, further, higher, lower, is only from the perspective of creation itself. There are those creation souls and angels in heaven that experience God, feel His nearness. We in this world have to discover Him and toil mightily to discover Him. God can be opposed even in this world and worse than that, ignored. That's how absolute is the concealment in this world. That He can be ignored. And we all know that to be ignored is far more painful than to be opposed. Somebody opposes you, at least there's a relationship. They're arguing with you, they're angry with you, you're still connected. But when your significant, someone close to you, precious, ignores you, that's the worst punishment we can can, uh, uh, afflict our fellow with. Dismissal. You don't exist in my world. But that's what exists in this world. God concealed himself to such a degree that we can ignore him. But that's all from our perspective. From God's perspective, there is no closer, there is no further. It is all within him. It's all within him. This is a very deep idea. The whole tzimtzum, the whole concealment, only creates distance and, and the screening, the veiling of the divine, the concealment, only from our perspective, but not so from God. I'll just mention one classic illustration to give some measure of insight into this. A teacher wants to teach a very deep concept to his students who are incapable of understanding the concept as the teacher does. His mind is an altogether um, higher or altered state even. So what does the teacher do? He takes the idea and he invests it in a parable, a story, the king, the king's daughter, the king's son, whatever the story happens to be. And he shares the parable. So the students are only hearing a story. But eventually, they will peel back the layers of the story and understand the symbolism. It may take 40 years. Actually, it does take 40 years. If it's a true master and a true disciple, I don't mean a teacher in the conventional sense. Teachers, conventionally, are just simply older and a lot more than the student. Their minds are not on a different level. They're not masters. They just went to school, university, got a degree, know the information as they teach it. Now, often the IQ of, the, of, of some of the students is far greater than the IQ of the teacher. I'm talking about a true master whose IQ is off the charts relative to the, teach, to the disciple. There are very few such masters. So he has to put it, or she has to put it in a parable. 
Then after 40 years, peeling back the layers and the symbolism, will the students be grasp the idea that's conveyed in the parable. But initially, all they're getting is a story. Initially, for the students, the idea is completely concealed in a story of a king, whatever the story happens to be, a parable. So for the student, it's concealed. But for the master, as the master is telling the parable, is the idea concealed in the master's mind? Of course not. The parable is his parable for his concept. Of course, it doesn't conceal the concept. Even as he says it. The concealment is only from the perspective of the disciple of the student. All to say, that from Hashem's perspective, the tzimtzum, the concealment, doesn't eclipse him and remove him. It does only from ours. But still, that's the reality. Hashem created a reality where we do not see or feel Him. Now, the other le levels of existence, it's all relative. The higher you go, the more, we, the more is experienced, the more is revealed. But it's still all concealment. As we described earlier, how the whole process began. So why did God do this? Why does he create this? Why did he create in such a way that there's the tzimtzum, as I explained, and then the kav, the, the light, the ray of light of divinity that's projected into the spiritual vacuum, and it's a whole elaborate ladder of, of worlds, the bottom of which is our universe, total eclipse, total concealment. Why? What's the purpose of it all? What's the objective? The truth is, we'll never answer why. There's no why. The question is what? What's the objective? We've spoken about this before. I'm not going to repeat that discussion. The question is what's the purpose? Not why is there a purpose? There is no why. Why does God exist? There's no reason. He is. Why did he choose to create? There is no reason. He chose. The valid question is, what's the purpose? We've explored that, explained that at great length in previous classes. So I won't repeat that again now. So the valid question is, so what's the point? So what's the objective? What do you want? So the Rebbe says, it's obviously not that we should draw into this spiritual vacuum the infinite light, as it were, prior to creation. Because then we're just going back to square one. What's been achieved? Why not leave well enough alone to begin with? It must be, and here comes this incredible teaching, there's a result of this distance and us overcoming it, and this whole teaching is to tell us how to overcome and heal and bridge the distance, we're not simply going back to the pre-creation with the infinite light filled all of existence, but something far deeper than that. Can you imagine? We're going to explore and understand how this is achieved. The, the Dvar Halacha, what that means by words of Halacha, and the story of Adam decreeing, settle, not settle, all will be explained. But what are we, what are, what's this solution to? It's a solution to there should be no departure. We've got to bring unity again between God and everything. There ought not be distance. You made that distance through the process of the concealment and so on, as we described, in order for us to heal it, to bridge it, to bring unity once again, but this time, a unity that's far richer and deeper than the original unity pre-creation where the infinite light filled all of existence. How so? What does this mean? Okay, friends, it's a very deep idea. We'll start to explain it now. And I hope by the grace of God, I will be successful in conveying this to you.
So let me express it first kind of succinctly as a kind of a formula, and then endeavor to fill in, to fill in the, the, uh, the gaps and leave us with some measure of understanding. So here's the general statement. Here's what's achieved, what the goal is in creating the separation to begin with, for which God is responsible. And he wants us to heal it and bring about something that is even richer, greater, and deeper than the very outset before it all began. And it is as follows again, first in general terms. Initially, as you heard me say, God revealed his infinite light and then concealed it, creating the vacuum, correct? The infinite light. By divine design, God reveals first this infinite light. And only then in stage two, he contains it and conceals it utterly. So right there, God's created a hierarchy of higher and lower. Infinite is more than finite. All appreciate that. Endlessness, infinite, is great and wonderful, and finite is limited. And one is high and one is lower. What he wants us to reveal, friends, is that for God, finite is no less than infinite is. It's all equally him. In Hebrew, bligvul and gvul, ain't surf, infinite and finite. It's all equally him. This is the most revolutionary idea possible. And it's that that we need to reveal in all of existence, but essentially down here. Here in this world where God has utterly concealed himself, this very power of God to conceal himself is no less divine and expressive of him than his infinite expression that began the whole process before he even limited or contained it. Let that sink in. That's what's been achieved. That's what's being achieved through our service, which will explain the words of Allah and the whole, the whole dialogue that we quoted earlier at the outset from the Gemara from the Talmud. It is our mission to reveal that the essence of God transcends finite and infinite equally and can be expressed and chooses to and is equally in the infinite and in the finite. The tiniest, smallest, most concealed reality which is basically what this world is. It's tiny, small, and it's all about concealment and limits. It's all him, no less than the infinite worlds and the infinite light is. No less, no less. It is our mission to reveal, I'm gonna use very, perhaps shocking language, stark and shocking language. It's our mission, and this has culminated in, in, culminated in the Messianic era, which we are working towards ever since the dawn of creation. Through the advice given in the Talmud that we quoted earlier, which we'll get to at the end. It is our mission to reveal retroactively in all of history and all of life. That everything is all him. All divine even where it had appeared to us to be the furthest from the divine how we do this we'll see at the end as we revisit the story and the teaching of Adam and settling and not settling but let's first understand the mission statement the mission statement is not as many understand it if you don't learn Hasidus you come to the following conclusion, which is true, but superficial. 
there's levels to truth. It's not the emet la amito. What is the true and therefore in the end not essentially true conclusion? Why are we here? Do you want to place up there? We come down here to face the trials of life in order to earn a high place in paradise. Says Hasidus, no. That's not the ultimate truth. And Hasidus reveals it in this story and every story in the Torah. The purpose is not to go high and ascend to some godly, loftier plane and bask in the divine presence. The purpose is to reveal that even in this world, no less than in heaven, it's all Him and it's all godly. And the essence of Hashem is not bound to either heaven or earth and is expressed in both equally. So it's heaven on earth. It's experiencing God in the body, in the physical, where He had been most concealed, where it's a limited, finite creation, not angelic and not soulful and not ethereal, physical. That too is all Him. And in fact, that expresses the depth of Him much more so than heaven. So why did God create the concealment? To go back to the infinite light? No. To reveal His essence which is beyond infinite. And that truth, His essence, in od milvado, that all is godliness and godliness is all, embraces even the minutia, the minuscule, the concealment, every moment, every experience of life and history. Whereas in the past till Mashiach comes, there may have been terrible moments of darkness and concealment. We are to reveal through the Dvar Halacha, that's how we do it, that all of that is divine. And no longer will it be concealing, but it will reveal His presence. The physical, the limitation, the finite, the moment in time. The physical experience, the physical sensation, the five senses, all of our personal history and collective will all in the end be, in the end, be expressive of His absolute and one truth. So what that explains, as we said earlier, why the teaching frames it, one should not take leave of one's fellow other than through a word of halacha we now have understood why it's phrased with a double negative rather than the simple affirmative because the simple affirmative would be saying well this is the way it should be there is distance there's closer there's further our sage is saying Al no there's no taking leave it's all about unity but there is this distance that God created through the tzimtzum as we described. This whole ladder of divinity, diminishing revelation, higher, lower, further, closer. Ah, that's only created by Him in order for us to overcome it, to bridge it, to heal it, and to reveal what? To reveal that He's not simply expressed in the infinite that precedes creation, the infinite light. But even creation and all of its limitation and finitude, it's all Him. So how was this done? It's done by the teaching. The teaching that we just shared from the Gemara. Rav Simi said, you reminded me of teaching of Rabbi Yossi. And what was the teaching? About a barren place. And Adam where he decreed to be settled is settled. Where he said... It shouldn't be settled. It's not settled. Who is Adam? Who is this Adam? We speak now again Adam, the very first man, Adam. On a much deeper level, it refers to God, the Adam Kadmon, the primal man, as it were. This is a terminology of the Kabbalah, Adam Kadmon. It means God's first articulated mission and desire. Settle this, 
Don't settle this. Talking about the world. God says, this is how you reveal my essence in the world. There's things that you settle and things that you don't settle. There are mitzvahs that you are to do and there are mitzvahs that say, don't do. Right? The positive mitzvahs, mitzvah taseh and mitzvah lo saseh. The affirmative commandments and negative commandments. The precepts, the prohibitions. That's the deeper meaning here. God decrees. This is how you make this world a home. For this is how you engage it. Some encounters, some demand do. And some in moments in life demand don't do. And it's only equally. And that's how you cultivate the world and make the world a home for me. And what's a home? A home is a place that is all expressive of the ones who live there. Notably, the Bala Tabaya, the Isha, she is the home. Every detail, she represents the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence. Every detail in the home is expressed. It's not a happenstance. Every detail in your home is because you've chosen it and placed it there. Whether it's functional, decorative, decorative in the way, and even the, the functional, you force it, it's this kind of force that you place it here. Because it's expressive of you. The home expresses you. So Hashem says, you, the mission is for you to reveal my essence where? Here in the physical world, de demonstrating that even the limitations of the physical world are all me. It's expression of me. And how will you do so? Settle and not settle. You do this, you don't do that. You separate your meat and milk, and you eat it this way. You place it here and not there. Your home is very specific. You want that object placed here, not there. That's because that's you. You want that painting, you want that, that, that uh, decorative piece that you bought. You want it specifically here and you don't want it there. It's you. That's your taste. God says, do this. Don't do this. That's my chosen taste. And that's how you connect to my essence and you make your life yourself, your body, a sanctuary for me, and you make the world a home for me. So, the teaching, the story about settling and not settling, that's what halach is all about. Halach is about the final articulated will of God. You see, friends, there are different levels to the Torah. There are levels of discussion and theory and different views. And that has its place. But that's not going to change the world, sitting in the house of study and debating the various positions and views and philosophies. What's going to change the world is this teaching. Settle, don't settle. Do, don't do. The final halacha, the final ruling. And this teaching is all about the final rulings. And they are do and don't do. Infant do is symbolic of the infinite. Don't do is the finite. Containment, it's all me. It's all one. You place the object here and not there, the net result is that's my home. This is my home. This is expressive of me. So Hashem says, I'm asking you, do it this way, don't do it that way. Place it here, not there. You put your switch on, 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 on Sunday, not on Shabbos. You'll eat this food, not that food. You wait this hours, not th those many hours. You wear your clothing like this, not like that. It's new, it's modest, and so on. All of these specifics, do it this way, not that way, is revealing me, says God, my essence in your life. That's the home. It's like this, and it's not like that. It's the infinite and the finite. The expression the holding back all is one and that's how we bridge the gap 
Al yipater adam chaveru. Do not take leave. God is talking to us here. Don't take leave of me. I know I created this distance. I thrust you into this world, into a body, where, as I said before, I can be opposed and ignored. I, I created that. For me, you're always forever close. But I want you to feel, you to feel our oneness. You have to reveal that. And I want you to reveal my essential being such that we are one, not just in matters of the spirit, not just in heavenly matters. We are equally one with, with your body in physical matters, in the most finite dimensions of your life. Make that godly reveal my presence there. And that's why mitzvahs are all about the specifics of this and not that. This way, not that way. And if I didn't, then there's teshuva that can rectify, even retroactively, all the failed and missed opportunities, all the violated opportunities. You can always redeem them. But it comes down to this incredible teaching where Adam, who's Adam? Adam is symbolic of God, the pr Adam Kadmon, the primordial man, the divine who decrees, this is how you make this world and you yourselves an abode, a sanctuary, a home for me. That's the solution to the, the distance that I've created. Not just bridge it once again, but bring to a connection that I'd never expressed before. God says, I only revealed at the outset my infinite power, my finite expression, I revealed as a second stage is something lower. You're going to reveal there's no lower, there's no higher. It's all me. You will reveal that truth. Angels don't know it. Angels live in higher spiritual worlds and look down at this world and they go, tusk, tusk, terrible place to be. And you're going to reveal that this world is the home ultimately for me. That I am expressed in the minutia of life no less than the infinite light. Again, that's what makes the home. It's the minutia and the detail, the nuance, that's expressive of the soulmates that live there. All right, friends. Genig, for me speaking, I'm going to unmute you and you're welcome to make a comment or ask a question. And I hope by the grace of the good Lord, we were successful.